Hello, it's Scott Manley here. This video of a rocket test has been doing the rounds on social media. This was the ninth firing in a series of tests of a 3D printed combustion chamber. It was designed to produce three tons of thrust, but very quickly the test goes spectacularly wrong. First, the carbon-carbon nozzle extension disintegrates, and seconds later, the combustion chamber breaks apart, and fuel sprays around uncontrollably until the test is ended. So this was part of NASA's Long Life Additive Manufacturing Assembly Program, where they're basically building rocket engines using 3D printing. And a recently published paper goes into specifically why this engine test failed. And interestingly, the paper doesn't actually care about the first thing that we see failing, that nozzle failure. They actually noted that the uh, nozzle extension had an existing defect in it and they expected it to fail at some point. So as spectacular as it is, the paper really doesn't go into any detail on this beyond saying, look, it broke. I mean, I could well imagine that the initial impulse of this process perhaps sends some shock up the combustion chamber which weakens something else. So that eventually, when the conditions are right, a crack starts to form and you can see it run around the outside before the entire chamber breaks apart. And when that, once that cuts, you can see the fuel getting sprayed backwards because the combustion chamber is of course cooled by passing fuel through the walls. Uh, that is liquid methane, you can tell because the feed line is you're covered in frost. And you can imagine that, that was spraying upwards and causing a big fireball just above the test stand. So anyway, if we run this even slower, during the nozzle separation, there is literally no frames showing this developing. It's there and then it's gone. I also found it interesting that the position of the shock diamond doesn't actually change that much despite the fact that the expansion ratio, right, that is the ratio between the size of the throat and the area of what's left of the nozzle, obviously that's changed a bit, but downstream where the actual shocks are converging to produce that hot spot hasn't changed very much. The chamber separation is a lot more interesting. You can see the crack starting at the 8 o'clock position and then developing around and then the entire chamber goes out. And immediately afterwards you can still see liquid oxygen spraying through the middle of the engine, but that actually stops pretty quickly. While the fuel that's flowing around the outside of the combustion chamber, that continues to flow for a whole lot longer. I can't be 100% sure as to why this is, but it does make sense to shut off the oxidizer before you shut off the fuel because the oxidizer can start a metal fire. And watching again in even slower motion, watch that cut develop and then the chamber separate. Remember, the chamber is going to be at pretty high pressure, so it's literally the gas pressure inside that chamber that's causing it to separate like that. Finally, if you watch the shock diamonds as this chamber begins to break, you see that it starts to move in as the leak reduces the chamber pressure and the exhaust gas velocity drops. But yeah, the fact that you need to flow fuel through the walls of the combustion chamber is one of the reasons why 3D printing is so interesting for rocket engines. So this was one of four different combustion chambers printed on a laser powder bed fusion machine. What that means is you lay down a very thin layer of metal powder and then you selectively melt it using a laser. And that gives you one layer of your design. Then you lay another thin layer of metal powder over it, fuse that, and that is how you build it up, layer by layer. And this can be useful for building some very complicated geometries that would usually require multiple parts and welding. So this chamber was made with a special copper chromium niobium alloy that enables better heat transfer. So the engineers wanted to know if there were problems with this system. And uh, they took the part that had failed and they began analysing it, in particular near the point where it had failed. And what they found on the images of the part before the test was that there was a thin line around which corresponded to a layer, right? A layer between the different powder beds. And this also corresponded to an interruption in the build cycle where the technician had to stop the process, open the machine up and you know, clean some powder out of an overflow system. There were actually three different interruptions that were documented in the logs, one of which was a power outage and the other two involved opening the machine up. Now, these interruptions were visible in three of the combustion chambers that were printed. The fourth one was incidentally a different design, so that wasn't included here. 
there were some other differences between the finishing processes used on all these parts. Now, the one in the middle, C3, it actually fired and operated correctly 51 times before it also developed a crack in that particular location, and the C1 was never actually tested. Now, the basic 3D printing process does produce metal with some porosity, and they want to minimise that to make stronger material. So they use a post-processing step called a hot isostatic press, and and as you can imagine, hot means, well, they're heating it up to about 900 Celsius. Uh, press means they're squeezing it to squeeze out the tiny holes. And isostatic means the pressure is coming from every side. And they do that by using high pressure argon gas, I think at about a thousand atmospheres of pressure. And that makes it slightly smaller. So anyway, yeah, they looked hard at the broken combustion chamber. Now this section on the left, that is the top of the combustion chamber. You see at the bottom right, there's a, a BD with an arrow. That's the build direction. So this is basically the top of the combustion chamber. And you see how they've highlighted some deformation there. That's where the, the uh, structure has flexed as it broke. But what they were really interested in is like these fine details that you see on the right, where they found like a unmelted powder and the contaminants that had uh, you know, got into the system. So it looks like in some cases there simply wasn't enough energy going in to reliably melt the powder that was being deposited. And the process of opening up the machine to empty the overflow meant that uh, there was possibly contaminants getting in, which again wouldn't help with the structural properties of the additively manufactured material. And if you look on the outside of the combustion chambers where the print interruption happens, uh, you can actually see, you know, in some cases, some change in the external structure or even actual things, uh, actual cracks on the surface. The one in the bottom right was the chamber that fired 51 times before it finally cracked. Now, after doing a whole lot of analysis on the combustion chamber that was printed, they also actually print up a whole bunch of uh, your test things and they generate pauses in the uh, manufacturer hoping to replicate some of these properties and see if they can understand them better. With these test pieces, they were able to measure the amount of elongation under stress and the ultimate tensile strength. And after destroying their pieces, they, of course, then looked at the places where they broke under microscopes. And, you know, you can see where the uh, snap would initiate and propagate across the structure. They looked even closer using electron microscope images. And to be clear, they didn't think the problem was as simple as pausing the print, opening the machine, and uh, letting contamination get in. It was a much more complicated process. In fact, one of the things they noticed was that throughout the test pieces that were printed, the porosity was increasing as they went higher and higher in the build. And so the defects lower down in the print were less of a problem. But they hypothesized that this was caused by variations in the effectiveness of the laser at melting the material. And since the machines showed no actual variation in their power requirements, they thought maybe this is because as the process runs on, more and more dust is getting deposited on the optics and attenuating the laser. Ultimately, they concluded that it wasn't any one particular problem that caused the failure. It was a combination of these issues, things that had to be addressed by stringent process controls. There's a trope that says that rocket science is hard. The truth is, rocket science isn't that much harder than any other type of science. It's the engineering which has much smaller margins for failure, such that a 1-2% to 2 increase in the defect rate in the affected layer was enough to make this happen. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.